What's going on, everybody? This is AJ, your host of the Blue Doreen Podcast. This is a very impromptu conversation that I had with a police psychologist out of California. Uh, she goes by the username Instagram, uh, the username Cop Shrink on Instagram, and her name is Dina. Uh, I reached out to her, just going back and forth regarding some things, and I actually asked her about cannabis use and what her thoughts were, and which kind of led to a, hey, let's jump on a Zoom call and have this conversation. And she agreed to allow me to uh, record it and post it. This conversation that I had with her ties directly into the previous conversation I had with the uh, chief deputy of Pinal County regarding mental health, and also an upcoming episode where I'm going to release here soon with a retired Scottsdale firefighter and his struggles with mental health. And in the law enforcement, first responder, EMS, firefighter world, military as well, the mental health trauma that gets pushed under the rug and pushed aside and you just suffer through and do your job, which I am also a victim of that, but not a victim. It's something that we chose, but did not understand the full realities of it. And I hope that everybody learned something from this particular episode and not just the first responder community, but everyone who's dealing with mental health, everyone who's dealing with PTSD, PTS, and everybody who understands that there can be post-traumatic growth. So I really hope that we can start breaking the stigma regarding talking about mental health, re talking about suicidal ideations, and start reaching out for help. And when it comes to the first responder world, that we can stop stigmatizing them so that they can get the help they need so that they can be the best possible public servant in order to come and help the general public. So that's my stance, and that's what it's always been, and I'll continue to be an advocate for this. So thank you very much for taking the time to tune in, and I sincerely hope and uh, hope that we all learn something. And as far as, you know, the first responder side of the house, please send this to people so that we can start spreading the message that it's okay to talk about it, and it's okay to ask for help. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope everyone enjoys this and learns a little something. Take care. All right, he threw some things out of the car, right? We're right there. He's throwing some things out the passenger side. They're along the, uh, the wall, the slow lane wall. We're 619, he's throwing uh, dope out the window. We got Bill from that wall coming out. 619, I copy Bill from that wall coming out of the window at 2328. Okay. Please, go for it. Yeah. Awesome. No, yeah, no, I agree. And, and again, this is like... Totally impromptu. So again, if everything's a little discombobulated, I apologize. But yeah, so um, I love conversations that are just on the fly because honestly, they're the most authentic, right? Well, and that's why I legitimately like podcasts because and my podcasts aren't scripted or anything like that. I just have people come on. And the whole the thing that I'm trying to do with my podcast is, is I don't know if you're aware of, I don't think we chatted, but I am former law enforcement. I spent yeah. 11 years on the job. Yeah. Um, I was a I'm a military vet, never saw combat, never went overseas, okay. uh, went into law enforcement, became an EMT also. And then through the traumatic events of, you know, law enforcement, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I made piss poor life decisions, which led to <laughs> abusing alcohol, which led to, you know, things that happened in my life. And I discussed that very openly in this previous podcast with the chief deputy of Pinal County. I love it. I love and, it. I love and it. That's, that's part of the journey is the talking about it and the healing from it, at least for me. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking to a talk therapist. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, just a little about my background, What, in case you don't know, or it's not obvious. Um, my passion is law enforcement, uh, paramilitary, military veterans, um, anybody that witnesses human suffering, yeah. bottom line, because human suffering is contagious. And no one warned us about that. Right. I grew up in a law enforcement household. I didn't know it. My grandfather was the chief of police. I just thought he was pretty handsome and cool and had a badge and a gun and drove a cool car. And um, and, and he was just always my hero. And um, as I got older, um, my passion grew. I was always very curious in why people do what they do. And, you know, hello, I grew up in a, an abusive home, not yeah. grandfather, but my own abusive home. And so I was curious about all that. So, um, I mean, the joke is when I told my mom, I was going to marry a cop, she cried and said, don't do it. You're making a big mistake. And, uh, you know, I laughed and said, ah, you know, he's different. And again, the sarcastic joke is moms are always right. Listen right. to your mother. Right. However, disclaimer, he's a great guy. We co-parent well together. We've been divorced for 11 years, but still have a really good co-parenting relationship. But 
I got to see the intricacies of living in the law enforcement culture and what that yeah. looks like and the yeah. toll that that takes. And um, I mean, I always knew I wanted to be a law enforcement psychologist. Um, I, this was always my passion, but it grew deeper and greater the more I heard stories yeah. about my grandfather, the more I lived my own life in, in the law enforcement culture. So I've been um, assisting to alleviate suffering one person at a time since 2011. Um, I teach at uh, basic sheriff's academies, police departments, fire departments. I work for wildland fire agencies, you know, federal, state, city. I'm kind of all over the place, but my hub where I see clients in my office is in Southern California. Okay. Um, did you get become a police psychologist after your marriage, after you got married to a police officer and then went that route or did that happen I, before? I did. Okay. Well, funny though, the, the, the passion grew before in the movie theater in 1987, I was sitting in that seat watching lethal weapon. Okay. And when Griggs is, you know, jumping off the, the roof with the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the suicidal I remember guy, that. right? He hands him a and, cigarette, then handcuffs himself and jumps off. Yeah. Right. And I was like, fuck, I love this guy. What the hell? I I, I want to get into this guy's head. What's happening? And and then I saw that there was a therapist in the movie, the police, right? The police psychologist in the movie trying to get yeah. him to come talk to her. And I was like, that's what I want to do. Like, give me the biggest challenge. I'll take it. Right. Um, and, and so I always knew in the back of my head, that's what I wanted to be. I didn't know how to get there or what that was going to look like just yet. I knew I was already in, I was headed to college. I went to college. Um, you know, the, the, the twists and turns of life along the way, it wasn't all a linear path. And I didn't right. become a knighted therapist when I was 25, like it took until I was 40. So I say, this is my third and final career and what I always wanted to be when I grew up and, and here I am. And nice. Just talking to my own therapist yesterday saying, you know, maybe I chose the wrong population to work with. <laughs> I'm fucking exhausted. Yeah, but you'll never run out of patients as long as we can get them to go in. Oh, oh, yeah. And and honestly, there's 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 not enough hours in the day for me to see all the people that want to see me. And I'm grateful awesome. for that. And I'm I'm grateful to see so many people coming in. But I also, you know, my challenge right now is finding the balance, the perseverance, the the resilience to keep doing this work. So my, my therapist yesterday, four o'clock, my appointment said, you know, what's your job satisfaction? I said, it has always been high, like 10 on a scale of zero to 10, 10 is my job satisfaction all of the time. She's like, but how's your personal satisfaction? Mm. How's your personal life? How's mm. your sleep? How's your health? How are your relationships? I'm like, they're all shit, right? They're all fantastically shit, but I love what I do. And I'll keep doing it. But and that's I exactly the cycle that first responders get into yep. and the people that help. That's yep. exactly the ones who deal with the trauma. That's ex the same thing that they get into. So I'm in good company. Not, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But I want to be, you know, when I first started to learn about boundaries, saying no to something so that I could say yes to me um, was for the CHP. Okay. I got a call saying we need someone's basically talk him off the ledge. Like he's hurting. He needs mm -hmm. help right now. Can you go right now? And it was like five 30. I had spent all day working. My daughter was waiting for me at home. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't. And I hung up the phone and I bawled my eyes out because, and I, and I said what all of my clients say to me, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me that I can't say yes. What's wrong with me that I don't have the strength, the energy, the capacity to do what I want to do. But I learned, hello, burnout. Yeah, That's called burnout. Yeah, and we and and then my own therapist had to say, Dina, you're not the only one in the world that could go to that call. I'm like, oh yeah. No, but you feel like you are. You feel like you are. You got the call. You've got to go. Exactly. And that's what all of my guys that are burnt out mm -hmm. say. And I said, you know, when is your day off? Well, I can't take a day off. We're short staffed. Mm -hmm. What happens if you don't go in? Well, then my other guys will have to fill in and then they'll be burdened. So I might as well go in because I want to be a team player. I want to support my guys. And I don't want to be that guy right. that needs a day off. I'm like, oh, you don't, you don't want to be that guy that needs to pay, protect your health. Right. Right. It's, it's a backwards system that we're in and and the personalities the the job picked us because we have the perfect personalities for it i agree with that statement right 
I agree with that statement. And, and that's exactly the problem that I, the trap door that I fell into, I had reached the highest level of being a, the highest level of detective in my agency. We were the, the unit that everyone else called when they were having a really bad day, when cops were involved in law or shootings and critical incidents and all that good stuff. It was my unit that went. So we were always the ones to go and we were the elite team. And, and it, I took pride in that. And then it got to the point where it was like, I was gone two, three, four, five days at a time. And then I would be in the office for literally 16 to 18 hours a day. And there, my personal life suffered, my home life suffered, you know, the relationship with my wife was became even more strained and my kids and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. But I had more pride in the job because I was the badass. Right. I was the savior. When you're having a bad day, you called me right. and, I'll, and I'll take care of everything. Right. So, you know, exactly where mm -hmm. I'm coming from. I say that, you know, Joe Citizen's worst day is a cop's every day, right? Yeah. Yep. Cop's worst day is my fucking every day. Yep. Every single day. Right. So, and yours too on a specialized yeah, was, unit. Yes. Right. Yes. So on that note, how we got here just now is, is that my whole thing, uh, when I got out of law, I was forced out of law enforcement. Um, and then I, went back to college, got my degree, and then I was injured. And through my injury, I discovered medicinal cannabis. Through medicinal cannabis for my back pain, I'm still fully herniated, have sciatica. So if you see me constantly shifting around, it's just because my, my back and my butt's killing me. But uh, we, I, I follow all the law enforcement pages and your your name on Instagram, if you don't mind me saying, please, oh, is, please do. is Cop Shrink. So very, very straightforward. <laughs> and so... um recently just within the last probably two weeks or three weeks or so we've made contact and because i follow all the law enforcement pages and mm -hmm. as much as and as i mean I'm, I'm wearing an arizona normal shirt you can see the big pot leaf in the back i'm extremely extremely <laughs> pro cannabis <laughs> right <laughs> extremely pro cannabis but i'm also still pro law enforcement and arizona is a very conservative state which is where i'm at so bringing these two things together has been difficult and i just recently had that conversation last week with the the number two of a large uh pinal county or uh, county sheriff's office here Pinal County, which if you're familiar with Sheriff Mark Lamb, he's all um, over the news and all over everything and in the law enforcement world. And yeah, yeah. You, you're am doing I a white blooded female? Of <laughs> yeah. course, I'm familiar you're, you're with Sheriff You're doing the same Sheriff thing Lamb. that most women do. Yeah. <laughs> but this, the gentleman that I interviewed is Sheriff Mark Lamb's right hand man. I follow him. So, yeah. and so we talked to, we talked about on the podcast with him, cannabis use and this or that, and just the understanding. And so just uh, today, which is what today is August 24th, I, I had that interview last week. And then I have an upcoming one that I'm going to release, which is with a gentleman, a Scottsdale firefighter who successfully committed suicide and was brought back. And so he's been on a couple of other podcasts. He, sh he shared his story and then I reached out to him. But here's the thing. I was friends with the guy 20 plus years ago, like personal friends with him, rode motorcycles with him, had a great time, haven't seen him in a long time and then saw this. So we sat down and talked. And it, the more and more I get into this, the more I realize that my passion is to talk about mental health. Love so it. a few minutes ago, um, I sent you an email or a, a text message uh, on Instagram and said, hey, you know, what are some current resources that law enforcement, public, ser uh, public service can use? And you gave me a couple of suggestions. Mm -hmm. And from there, it just kind of spawned off a, a quick conversation with us. And then I said, um, let me see here. Yeah, please feel free free to read it. It's yeah, yeah, good. yeah. So the the resources you had said was Kevin Gilmartin's book, uh, "The Emotional Survivor for Law Enforcement," and then the other one that you had mentioned is resiliency. And um, so then from there, I said something about cannabis, and then you made a comment on my Instagram page, and you had stated something that it's it's. Please say and correct me and stop me. It was disassociative from the body and mind, right? And you need to heal the body as well. Right. Right. So, so from there, that spawned our conversation a pretty uh, in depth when we started talking about. And I said, I appreciate your perspective on cannabis, but I had agreed, uh, disagree in certain aspects. I said, I've had tremendous success dealing with trauma through its use and the dealing with its trauma. It was actually accidental, was incidental to me using it for my, for my pain. Mm -hmm. And that's what kind of led us to chatting back and forth. Like, Hey, let's just jump, jump on a zoom call. Love it. Love it. So, love so and let, let me give you a little bit of, and I said it before, but um, mm -hmm. I was using cannabis for my back pain and I was using it for my back pain and I wasn't really thinking about the mental health aspects of it at all and didn't understand. And then one particular night, you know, it's 12, 31 o'clock in the morning. I'm, I'm, you know, I am 
medicated. And yes, we can all agree there's a way to medicate and then there's a way to recreationally use. Right. And big, I think that big, big, big difference that and I have no problem with about. recreational use. Got okay. Right. Okay. So, and if you're res- if you are responsible, you know how it affects you. You you control the circumstances mm-hmm. for safety. No one gets hurt. Like, knock yourself out. You no, know? unfortunately, experience. that's not the same right. for everyone else that's recreational using. They Agreed. are right. Their memory is shot. They're getting in trouble at work. Their relationships are shit. Um, Disneyland right now, their number one call is hyperemesis. Oh, from overuse. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Pop a couple gummies. Don't feel anything. Pop a couple more. Pretty soon, they're hurting and they need help. And I'm like, you fucking idiots. Sorry, I, but, I cuss a lot. And but right. So so my complaint is, I'm in Southern California. It's legal. It's all over the place. And frankly, you can't walk. You can't drive a few miles without seeing another dispensary. Right. And it scares me. It scares me because. Who's working the dispensary? Who knows what they're giving? What's the dose? What's the strain? Does this consumer know what they're getting? Do they know how it's going to affect them? And there's a big fear, particularly for young adults whose brains are still developing. I've seen psychosis occur and stay. So it's not just a temporary Mm -hmm. psychosis in one dose. So they had one recreational night and now they're forever changed. And that's the, that's the part where science needs to catch up mm-hmm. because when you, and the, and the other thing is though, too, is that the cannabis of now is not the cannabis of 20 years ago. I always say it's not the dirt weed of my youth. It's not, it's <laughs> not. And the thing about that is, is the responsible use. And, and like we had said in the messages, like, that's the problem though, is there's no dosage, right? There's a, a gram use for you and a gram use for me. And then also being based upon the fact that we all have an innate endocannabinoid system that processes everything differently. You know, it's not like alcohol where 99% of the bodies process alcohol the same way. We have a pretty good general understanding of that. Right. But real quick though, are you, are, do you, are you aware though, that um, if somebody has, you know, in those, yes, you can have an overdose on cannabis, you know, looks like paranoia, anxiety, all that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, possible vomiting and all that with the hyperemesis. But are you aware um, that CBD is the breaks to THC? And if you're if you're in that elevated state of anxiety and freaking out and all that stuff, mm-hmm. all you need to do is take about 100 milligrams of CBD. Oh, that's interesting. No, it'll I immediately come down. Really? Yep. Really? Yep. Yep. And I'd... why doesn't it, why doesn't every package come with that warning like here's your break the glass if you know and here's your shot of cbd there is a company uh, uh, out here in arizona that does cbd chocolates they've just also moved into thc they mm-hmm. in their thc bars they give you i can't remember it's a 25 milligram or a 50 milligram uh cbd bar it's called an even out bar oh i love that yeah love so that. my love wife that. works in healthcare, and she has uh people that come into their and she's been around me you know using and educating myself and all this good stuff mm-hmm. and i'm gonna have one of the er doctors come on and i was taught i actually had to go to the hospital i had a little pancreatitis a few months ago no big deal um i was talking to him about it and we got to talking about cannabis use and i said that to him and he goes are you serious i go yeah i said if you get these kids coming in freaking out i go I no go idea. get a 2,500 milligram of CBD oil tincture, drop, put a few drops under their tongue and then send them out the door. And then where's the data? Like we need data to support that. Right, so we can right. say, look, out of a thousand patients with this, you know, we gave them this even out dose and 990 of them responded well. But so we need, so then we can go, okay, this is how we're yep. going to treat this. Yep. You know what I mean? And then EMTs can have it. And- yep. Right. We we would avoid now. There are stories of, and I've heard a couple of chil- of very small children getting into the high dose edibles and then actually having seizures. I don't have any facts on that. I don't have any stats on that. I have just heard through the grapevine. So yeah, I, don't I don't have know any, how that could even be possible. Like, I don't know either. And the system, like, how does that even cause a seizure? I, but I'm not a medical doctor. I, I have no idea. Well, and I had asked you in our text message, have you even heard of the endocannabinoid system? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Oh, absolutely. You're ahead of the game. You're, you're ahead of the, a lot of the people, especially here in Arizona, because people just medical doctors. And again, my wife works in healthcare. So I have a lot of exposure to medical doctors. They've never heard of it. Um, it's not taught. It's, it's, there's zero understanding of it Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it's all throughout our bodies. It, it's a legit real thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And I, and I'll have to tell you that I have found a phenomenal CBD cream for my Mm -hmm. own, like chronic pain issues. And 
it's amazing. Like it, it saves my life. Like if I wake up at two in the morning with pain, I slather a bunch of that stuff on and it's amazing. I can go back to sleep. So I believe in the, in the endocannabinoid, I can't even say it, that <laughs> endocannabinoid, <laughs> or can, can, it depends on how you say it, cannabinoid or cannabinoid, however you, however you pronounce it. Endocannabinoid, yeah. ECB, EBC, I don't uh, know, that uh, system. ECS. ECS. And, and I, so I'm familiar with how that system works and how amazing and powerful CBD mm-hmm. can be. The fear is the THC piece. Yes. And what happens? And, and how does the body respond? How does the mind respond? How does the person respond? And so, so in our conversation, uh, you, we weren't really disagreeing. Because, no, no. And, yeah, no. Right. Which was nice. And, and I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not against disagreeing. Like we can disagree and talk right. about our reasoning and, and all of that. And, and I'm not, I'm not out to convince anybody of anything. You know, it's just nice to have a healthy conversation mm-hmm. about, about things. Um, and so you know, we were, we were, I was highlighting the proper use. I'm like, look, you were using it properly mm-hmm. in the right settings, in the right circumstances with socials. You had the intellect, you had mm-hmm. the understanding, you know? And so th- that's so cool that like by accident, you landed on this shortcut to healing. So that's right. That, that's a very accurate way to put it. And I'll give you the description so that when I post this up, people can know what the hell we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, Wait, I was having the conversation with you that it, I I have achieved phenomenal mental health success using cannabis, and it was accidental. I I think I started to sell the story, twelve thirty at night, one o'clock in the morning. I was heavily medicated, and the next thing you know, I was thinking about this traumatic event. And again, have are you familiar? Have you ever used THC? If you uh, are okay, so you understand how the mind starts going and thinking about this mm-hmm. and grooving up to music and this or that. And my, I was just not doing anything really in particular. And I am Italian, so I talk with my hands, sorry. <laughs> um, um, so and I wasn't really thinking about anything in particular, but then all of a sudden my mind just switched to this traumatic event. And the next thing you know, I was thinking about this traumatic event and I was standing in my kitchen and all of a sudden I have tears coming out of my eyes and I'm remembering this traumatic event. It was the death of a police officer and- the next thing you know, I'm I'm going through the the thing, the the event, step by step by step by step. That's the but, unpacking. Yes, mm-hmm. but I wasn't re I was I wasn't there, okay. but I was remembering it. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden I started processing all of these emotions and I started to cry and I started to let it out. And again, this is all in my kitchen. There's nobody else around me. It's you know, you know, like I said, late late at night. And then, and it took a long time. I was probably in that state for 30 to 45 minutes, but I just let myself go. And then I thought about the individual pieces and I thought about this and I thought about that. But the the most amazing part that I accidentally realized was that when my brain had had enough and I had emotionally had enough, I was able to say, all right, I need to think about something else. And then I just transitioned. And I was like, okay, that was kind of cool. So the next morning after I went to bed and I woke up, I I kind of sat there for a little bit. And I just kind of thought about what had happened to me. And then I started to, I was totally unmedicated, had just woken up. And I started to think about that event again. And I was able to think about that event. I was able to remember that event. I was able to not start bawling my eyes out. I was Emotion able to- Emotion was detached now. Yes. And mm-hmm. I was able to go back. And even from then, I would not have been able to- st- sit here and tell you that story right. had Without I not have gone through that. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. I, w- I wouldn't have even started to talk about that story. So there's the shortcut. So let me connect the dots. Sure. The shortcut that occurred was the dissociative property that, that happened that separated you from your mind and your body. And, and so you were able to sort of hold both of these things at the same time. Right. So the body rem- and so you were able to look at it in a detached view yes that's the whole goal of processing trauma is to detach that distressing emotion and that fight flight freeze response that occurs in the body okay so that we can heal that's the whole goal and but we can't get to it because the distress is so great and this is why we have men and women killing themselves because the distress is so great. They can't handle it. No. That's not to say they're weak. They're exhausted from handling it every single minute of every single day. And it's exhausting. And so there's, you know, I've looked at the different therapeutic modalities and I use several of them, EMDR, mm-hmm. um, NLP, um, brain spotting, you know, all of these different modalities to try to 
get that detached view. Okay. Right. Um, and, but how beautiful that that happened for you, like in that, that shortcut manner. And, and so now let me ask you when you go back to, well, you're back to it now and there's no emotion going on. There's, right? there's no emotion to it. There's, there are, there are there's things, the healing. right. Healing happened. There are still some things, unfortunately, that it's not that I can't talk about it emotionally. It's because there's still things in play that I can't say. So gotcha, um, gotcha. I, I don't. Gotcha. Um, but when you think about it, do you, is there any attachment to guilt, to anxiety, to feeling like you're there again in the moment? No. But I did have no, not when I stop and think about it. I did have a very weird thing happen though, a, a little bit of time after this. Um, it was a certain smell that took me back, and it wasn't a bad smell. I it all smells, smells are time machines. Mm, and I, and I kind of, and I, and when it happened, I did kind of go back there for a minute and then I was able to, you know, snap myself out of it for a little bit and then think about it. But no, there's no attachment to, I'm, I'm able to have the conversations and where this event took place, I, I, I avoided it for the longest time. And then I ended up going back there after I'd had this, this moment of clarity. I, I don't know what the, the, the term to say is. And, and I never want to say that I'm healed from PTSD through cannabis. No, I'm just able to disassociate from it and then think about it in a, differently. Kind of sounds like you're healed. To me. <laughs> I mean, right? if we were to, you know, give you an assessment to determine your the, the presence of um, the, the PTS, PTSD, I, I would get, I would almost be willing to bet that the numbers have gone down. The scale has come down. The okay. distress has come down. It'd be really cool to, to even check that for yourself, you know, take an assessment. I can email you one sure, that I get sure. from the VA. It's directly from their assessment um, and caps. I think it's called and you can look at those questions and likely remember where you were before that mm -hmm. event. You know, a year. How long ago was that, by the way? The the event itself. Yeah. Uh, November eight of two thousand sixteen. Like Look I'll never forget powerful. that moment where yeah, yeah, yeah where yeah. that yeah. moment was. It was, wow. it was also voting day back in two thousand sixteen as well. So ah, uh, very very pivotal day. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So that's really really cool, and um. It, it, that's just the power that's, that's powerful to hear. But so here is where the, I get hyper as a mental health professional about promoting cannabis use, because we, we have to do it in a responsible way with the parameters that work. So if you think about all the things you have in play for you, you have a loving wife, you have a safe home, you probably have you know, you have these like safety security mm -hmm. features, right? You have an intellect, a critical thinking mind. You had mm. been set. <laughs> mm. well, I mean, on the surface, it looks right. like it to me. I, mean, I can fake yeah. it till I make it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, well, you, you have this natural curiosity. It sounds like you're, 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 yes. you want to learn more. You're, you have this intellectual capacity, right? And, and you're not a know-it-all. And, no. and I say that because, People that feel like they have to know it all or command, you know, command that they know it all. There's no, where's the opportunity for learning, right? How are you going to learn anything if you know it all? Um, which is another, I'm going to go off on a tangent because I have ADD, but that that's the, the, the paradox too, of the rescuer, healer, hero, right? First responder is you're supposed to know it all. Yep. That's what you're doing here. Yep. Right. But I always say, well, even brain surgeons can't operate on themselves. Like, come on. <laughs> People would be terrified to know the fact that many, many surgeons in the middle of the surgery pull up their phone and Google it. Absolutely. And YouTube it. That Absolutely. shit happens. Absolutely it does. What you learn in school is you don't learn everything in medical school. You learn how to learn. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. learn how to learn so that when you come upon something that you're like, hmm, well, I know. And see, here's the, here's the proper use of Googling. Yeah. I know what I know. I know what I don't know. I know that these things can happen. Okay. Well, that doesn't work this way. And right. The decision tree is already laid out, but you're missing some pieces. So you Google it. When people Google, they're like, ah, boom, there's the answer. I'm like, you don't, you don't know you, because you don't know what you don't know. Right. So, so absolutely. Uh, but then there's that pressure, that internal pressure of, well, I'm supposed to know, right. Even as therapists, I go through that too. Like, oh, I can't share my, my breakdown because I'm supposed to be the one all pulled together. No, I'm not. I'm not. 
not. I have days that don't go well. And nope. But I still pause to share that because I don't want people judging me and going, oh, God, that therapist is crazy. <laughs> well, I just have a system in place to figure out the crazy and get through it. <laughs> right. That's a good thing. <laughs> right. Right. So you might need to pull me back to the train of thought we were on. I feel like I was making a connection and I lost it. But I have ADHD, too, and I haven't medicated yeah, I yet. So my ADHD is <laughs> flying high right now, too. No, but, and also I'm, it's exciting to have these conversations. Yeah. And that was the thing though, too. I'm very happy that you said it though. Like, I'm not here to convince anybody of anything. I'm just here to talk about my experience and what I had. Yeah. But on the ADD, ADHD note, um, that is the one thing though, too, that I seriously, seriously found. I, I, I I did, I was not diagnosed as ADHD until I was 35 years old after Mm -hmm. my, my event had happened after my stupidity happened in law enforcement and all that. Mm -hmm. When I was in with a counselor, I had a moment where I, you know, I went ding, 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 ding from, from thing to thing. And she goes, Oh, well, your ADHD is in full effect. And Mm -hmm. my wife was sitting right next to me and I, and I apologize. I've got the, the free thing of zoom. So we got about 10 minutes left. Ah. Um, so, but no big deal, but, um, when I can, I can, I can change that in a second, but, um, I said, she, the, the therapist said, oh, your ADHD is in full effect. And my wife was sitting next to me and I looked at her and I went, what? What? what are you she goes, about? you're very obviously have ADHD. And I looked at my wife and my wife looked at me and I was like, what? Are, no, I, I do. And from that, it kind of, a lot of things from my childhood started okay. to kind of come together and understand why I sucked at school. And that I was going to be my this. next question is, did you do a very comprehensive history because PTSD often looks like ADHD? And no, and it was at that moment where I was like, I, I didn't really understand it and wasn't really even diving into it at that point in time. And then when I started using cannabis, it was like, um, hey, I can focus. I can actually, not necessarily on the conversation piece, but I can actually focus on something for more than three and a half seconds before I'm bored with it. And I can, you know, I can sit and analyze things and talk about things. And it allowed me to like, take for instance, music. Um, I could hear a song a thousand times and I can sing the words, but I, my brain doesn't put together the lyrics. Mm. I started using cannabis and listening to music. Yeah. Weed makes music so much better. But um, <laughs> when I did that and I started actually hearing the lyrics, my brain actually put things together and I was actually understanding more. I was like, holy shit, this is weird. Wild. Yeah, Wild. and it, it was, there were a lot of things where um, I can hold. And now, again, if I use too much, then I'm, you know, off in la la land, you know, just kind of right. doing there's my that, own thing. Right, there's that sweet spot. Yes. And that's that proper use. And gosh, we need to dial that in somehow and do a better job. Agreed. there's so much power and value in its use. But the problem is, I think we have a lot more overuse and a lot more problems than we have solutions. That is true. And I mean, and the other part is too, is it's still a schedule one. So I, there's only one medical medical doctor that I'm aware of that's even won the right to do the tests mm-hmm. that I'm aware of. I said there might be more, but nobody has done these controlled controlled mm-hmm. studies yet. Nobody's using it as you know it's why? being it's being prescribed as medicine, not prescribed, but recommended. Right, right, right. Yeah, do you know why there's no studies? No. There's no money in it. Which is stupid because it's weed. I know. Like there would be so much money in it if they got on top of it. No, but there's no there's no governmental, and this isn't political, but Mm. there's no governmental regulation or ownership, right? If I have this molecule and I own it, right? Now I can sell it to you Mm -hmm. with a lot of money. But we have this free, naturally growing plant right. that everyone has access to. So until someone, but but I, I appreciate people that are really diving in and doing the work and creating CBD creams and oils and chocolate bars and like they're doing that hard work. And I hope that that gets, that pays off for them. And I hope that they're able to benefit from that and others are able to benefit from that, you know, well, but and- you're but you're right for, for, for greater use and greater good there, there needs to be a lot more data, a lot more regulation, a lot more quality testing. Um, I certainly don't want the FDA to do it. No, 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 no. (laughs) I don't want the FDA any touching, touching cannabis in any way, shape or form. Right. right, Well, and that's the one thing though, that's amazing to me is the fact that like, why aren't pharmaceuticals actually getting into not pharmaceutical cannabis, but cannabis, cannabis, it's renewable, you know, it's, you can, you can dial it in and and really start focusing in on it. Now, I don't want, you know, 
whatever Pfizer or whatever in my weed, but they have the ability to do the science. They have the ability to do all that good stuff. Like yeah, I, I, don't I just know. don't I, understand. There's got to be a, a a link we're missing. Like, well, they couldn't. Ha- I don't know. I don't. I don't know. There, there's probably because then the FDA wouldn't regulate them. They wouldn't be able to to market it and commercialize it. And get, I, don't, I don't know. There's. It's likely because there's no money in it somewhere. And which is amazing to me because they could then just sell it recreationally and then, you know, then they've got all the money on the, on the planet that they need. Right. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. If some, if, if a company were to dial in the dose and the strain and the quality control measures and, and then bottle it and sell it, like they'd make billions of dollars. They'd make billions of dollars. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But unfortunately, we've been living under this, you know, basically prohibition law for so long, yep, yep. you know, that we haven't had access or we couldn't even look at it without getting in trouble, you know? Well, and if you go back to, well, I'm going to get controversial here. I mean, if we go back to the origins of why it's actually illegal, you know, if you go back to. I don't the, even know that. Well, the Hearst family that the uh, oh. Hearst family that owned all the paper mills that owned the 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 largest newspaper in production, mm-hmm. and all that they had all their money tied into lumber, forestry, and all that type of stuff. Because hemp used to be used for textiles and rope right. and clothing and oils and everything. Yeah. Right. And then it also used to be in medication up until the nineteen twenty. And I I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but it used to be in or the the dates. Um, mm-hmm. It used to be in medicine up until the 1920s, really? and then there was the controlled stuff, or the the anti cannabis act of the early late 1920s or early 1930s, and the big push was coming from the Hearst family, who didn't want to lose their investment in the lumber field and the timber and all that stuff, mm-hmm. so that's why it was uh, mm-hmm. illegal. There is also the um, the thought that back in the day when jazz music was up and coming. Jazz music was predominantly from the the black community, mm-hmm. and jazz musicians were were using cannabis. And there was the you know I mean racism back in the day was very 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 real, mm-hmm. and the thought was was that oh these black jazz singers are going to come into town and they're gonna they're gonna steal the white women and all that type of stuff oh, like goodness. these are real things that the government perpetuated. So it became vilified as yes. a result of oh this population is yes. using it therefore it's evil. Yes. There was a, it's called the, you can Google it right now. It's called the LaGuardia Report. Mm-hmm. Back in the early 1940s, the LaGuardia Report um, totally debunked the fact in the 1940s that it is not a public health concern. It is not a gateway drug. They've known this since the 1940s. Alcohol and cigarettes are the mm-hmm. gateway drugs. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, would you agree with that statement? Um, I wouldn't. Okay. Because I believe that any drug that alters reality is a gateway drug to more drugs that alter reality. So um, I would call sugar a gateway drug too. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because that's kind of exactly the way that I think. I mean, you have just in Arizona alone, and I can only, I know California has a significantly larger population. You have 300,000 approximately medicinal card holders. We only went recreational a few, uh, two years ago. Mm -hmm. So we have 300,000 medical card holders those medical card holders have not switched to opioids. They got off of opioids mm. and got onto cannabis. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. research has shown, mm-hmm. and yeah, and uh, Colorado has a lot of good information as well mm-hmm. that cannabis, as far as opioid use, mm-hmm. is an exit drug. It's an exit oh, out of for opioids. Sure. And I agree with that line of reasoning. But if we if we reverse engineer that and we look at abusers. Mm. So those that are are addicted to substances to alter reality, um, anything can be a gateway drug. And Amen. so likely, you know, cannabis use is going to lead to heroin, to meth, to, you know, to, to anything else that's going to alter my reality. Uh, you know, when I was in the throes of, I just want to alter my reality because I can't stand the pain anymore. I would take anything, mm-hmm. like, whatever you got, that's going to alter how I feel right now. I'm taking it. Right. So I love that there's there's a fantastic argument for its proper use yes. in the right way. And 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 so so maybe that they're not even connected. It's not the drug itself, it's the addiction problem. And 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 I Amen. believe here's here's the other piece about addiction. You cannot cure addiction unless you cure the trauma. 
Amen. Period. Amen. End of sentence. All of the rehabs have revolving doors if they're not treating the trauma. No addiction exists without trauma. Amen. And yeah, no addiction. It doesn't right? matter. It doesn't matter whether it's overeating or whatever the case is. Absolutely. There's trauma underneath there. God, uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, the Canadian physician, um, has written some amazing books. Uh, one of my favorites is called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. And he talks all about that that connection between addiction and trauma. And it, it's just not talked about enough. And so, you know, if we get back to our conversation about trauma, how do we heal it? And what are the, the, the best avenues to heal it, right? We've got cannabis mm-hmm. as a resource. We have therapists as a resource. We have, you know, um, all of these other, you know, meditation, resiliency mindset, um, um, all of these other a- avenues to use. And I think that, you know, it's kind of like a menu, like, or choose from the menu, what's going to work most effectively for you, but also they can't be used all by themselves. You know what I mean? Like yes. you can't just go yes. to the cupboard and go, let me pull out the cannabis and use it. Like you, you right. better have the circumstances, um, ready for that. You know what the, in my conversation with the firefighter, I mean, you know, and you'll a- appreciate this analogy. We need a toolbox yes, with many, many tools. Yes. And in the law enforcement world, that analogy is used and used and used and used and used and overused sometimes. All in the deaf ears. And it's it, 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 but it's so true. And you don't understand these things until you've been through a crisis, gone through the crisis, done the work. And I was I was talking with that gentleman, and I and I asked what were I said, have you ever used cannabis? He goes, oh, recreationally a, a while ago, and he goes, but I don't need to now. He goes because this thing worked. You know, that thing, this is what my breakthrough was. Mm-hmm. This is what his breakthrough was. Right. Just like, uh, I don't know if you keep up on the news, but there's a huge push for psychedelics right now. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's, it's scary because, mm-hmm. and I don't know enough to even speak intelligently about it, but my fears um, for that are the same as cannabis. If people are going to grab it and, and think it's the, the magic pill, that's going to cure everything. But I'm, I'm saying you, you don't, don't get your hopes up because we need to one, use it properly under the proper circumstances with the proper resources and support. It's not going to work for everybody because not everybody is going to have the same level of resources and circumstances to use properly. Right. Taking a handful of magic mushrooms and then going to a concert is not going to deal with trauma. Exactly. You know, taking, you know, a, a gram or two of psilocybin in a setting to where you have a therapist right. and it's a controlled environment, yep. that's going to do the work. Absolutely. Absolutely. MDMA has been mm-hmm. used underground in therapy rooms for decades. Okay. And, and I'm only, I've only hearing about the, the therapeutic effects of MDMA very recently. Cause mm-hmm. I listened to a bazillion podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of them, Joe Rogan had on uh, uh, one of the guys from maps and he was mm-hmm. talking about MDMA usage and all that good stuff. And I was like, I didn't even realize. I knew it as the party and the rave drug 20, 20 plus years ago. Oh, and we gosh. just called it ecstasy. Right, right, right. But no, it's such a powerful drug that can be beneficial, again, if used in the proper dose, in the proper circumstances, in the proper conditions. Yeah. Just like but anything. Just like anything, right? It, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I I really appreciate this conversation and I really appreciate just the impromptness of it and just the the dialogue back and forth. This is awesome. But you know what the cool thing is though, too, is that people, therapists um, are starting to understand that it's not just one thing that heals. It's not just sitting and talking. Okay. Sitting and talking no. is an element of it. It's a part of it. Um, right. There's so right. many different aspects to it. That's vital. And, you know, if, if you only have one tool um, to apply to everything, it's just not effective. And what's that saying? If you, if you only have a hammer, everything is a nail. Yes. 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 And then every person thinks, Oh, I need that hammer. It's going to work for me. Well, it's not, it's not. So we have to, and and so we have to be educated enough to understand what tools are, how they work, why they work, what's going to work for me. uh, And, and what do I need? Yeah. It's different. And and there are some people that are going to throw this conversation out and say, yep. you guys are both kooks 
and how dare you even talk about using the devil's lettuce right. and right. I get, okay, I can eat fine. That's, that's fine. Then, then don't listen, take what you leave and leave the, you know, take what you can use and leave the rest. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm not afraid of, uh, of having conversations that are hard and, you know, I would say, you know, can we be a little open-minded to see that there's some value here? You, no one can deny if, if you're talking to somebody who was in the throes of, of long-term serious mental suffering due to PTS and traumatic situations, and they used a substance, no matter what the substance is. And the next thing you know, they're better. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's anecdotal. No, there was no science behind it. But at the same time, you cannot deny that mm -hmm. that worked for them. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just Absolutely. one of the pieces. Absolutely. And then as the, the practitioner, I have to look at that and go, okay, why did that work? Mm -hmm. Let me deconstruct the pieces of this person and their life and their circumstances to understand why this worked for them. I mean, sometimes we might land on huh, fluke, lucky science, who knows, you know, it was the moon was in the right direction, right. You know, right? But I, I believe we can find um, elements of, of hard okay. evidence that go, okay, look, we've got this, this circumstance that works. And so, you know, maybe that is, you know, using a psychedelic in an office with a therapist guided, you know, it, it, you know, I, talk about ayahuasca for a minute let's talk about ayahuasca there's power in it yes i've seen that however i also see the dangers in it if there if the user isn't educated and doesn't understand the the power of it and 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 really connect with the right practitioner right right it can be misused um and people can get hurt but but again, there's that open-mindedness. I have open-mindedness. Did it work for some people? Absolutely. It's it's dangerous to promote it as a healing component without the disclaimer of these are the things that are required. You know, yeah, and there has to be guardrails in, in place. I love that guardrails, guardrails, absolutely. And specifically speaking about ayahuasca, I know someone. I do not know. I, I have a connection to this person who um, they went on an ayahuasca trip. For whatever their purpose was, I don't know that backstory. However, um, since that ayahuasca experience, the person has, for lack of a better term, uh, gone off the deep end, and it's not good. In this, in this, in this family, it's through a friend of a friend, and they're watching this family kind of crumble right now because this person has now gone back and keeps doing ayahuasca and mm -hmm. keeps doing it and keeps doing it under the wrong circumstances, not guided. And it has led to the family is now actually crumbling. And that's just one circumstance. And again, there's so many powerful stories of it healing, but the reality is, is it's not for everybody. Right. Right. There are side and effects to everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we can't be, you know, promoting, it to everybody, you know, it has to be promoted with those, those warning labels or the guardrails or what have you, because I'd be willing to bet you this person that we're talking about has some severe underlying trauma that's not being addressed. And he right. thinks, she thinks that the ayahuasca is just going to magically cure it. That's exactly what it is. It just doesn't work that way. The, um, on a side note, the one thing, if, if, I don't know if you've heard that the state of New Jersey uh, the uh, the New Jersey Attorney General has come out and said that law enforcement is actually allowed to use cannabis and they're not going to test for it. And from that, um, everyone's moving to New Jersey, <laughs> right? From that, um, what was kind of cool through the through normal, um, my organization was contacted by a police officer who then I got in contact with and, I, and I'm helping them come together as a group and as a law enforcement association and help promote it. Um, mm -hmm. so they're not currently being tested. And I have some contacts with these police officers who are telling me that like, dude, I take a one, my drinking has gone down substantially and I take one gummy at night and I'm sleeping through the night. Wow. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's these sort of things where, okay, see now New Jersey can be the pilot program yeah. we need to gather and collect the data and evidence to show that it is effective. Cause my initial, my initial response to that is oh shit we're in big trouble see and i and i'm the exact opposite i cannot wait for the day when every yeah. single cop can come home and smoke a joint and actually mm -hmm. decompress mm -hmm. as opposed to grabbing that glass of whiskey and slamming that that alcohol oh i mean if we had to compare 
you know, whiskey to cannabis, I'd choose cannabis all day long for sure. I mean, alcohol destroys more lives um, and certainly does a lot more damage. And yeah, but, but, but here's where my fear comes in with regard to that cannabis use. It's fat soluble. It yes. stays in your system a lot longer. It could be released at a time, you know, if it's in there, it's, it's, it's hiding in there. It can be released at, at, at a time you're not, you're not prepared for, you know, I've never had that happen or, or had that experience though. Okay. And I, I don't know if it's, you know, and obviously I'm not a scientist or a medical doctor and I do understand that, but I don't know if would the components reactivate in a, you know, in a, in a psychoactive way and give you that high. I don't know. You know, I'm, I don't I'm a know f- about that. I mean, I've seen it. So when I, I worked in rehabs for okay. a, be- a period of time and, and what I saw was, you know, when someone was detoxing um, and the primary drug of choice was cannabis in some form, they were very sleepy, very mm-hmm. fatigued, very like for 30 days, you know, and and I kept asking like, well, why, why aren't they bouncing out? You know, like they're in the couch all day long, what's mm-hmm. happening, mm-hmm. you know? And the doctors were saying it's because it's fat soluble. It's in their fat cells. And okay. It's going to take time for it to process out. So I wonder what those long-term effects are. So like, say, so, you know, Joe cop goes home and, and smokes a joint, goes to sleep, wakes up the next day, does, does his daily thing. And all of a sudden he's, you know, in the middle of a call and gets this hit of exhaustion. Like, is that going to happen? I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't even know if that's really a thing, but it would be, I would be curious to find out what this, what the data says, what the science supports. That's the problem is we need that. I'm, and I'm a 100% one of these people that I, again, I will never sit here and champion that anything is for anyone. We need that data. We need that information. Yeah, we really do. We really do. Yeah. I, you know, I, who I bet might do it is, well, I don't, I mean, we would need that clinical data, but Huberman, Andrew Huberman. Mm, God, I would um, I've, I've sent him a message before and he hasn't responded to me. I'm, I'm still small potatoes. I know that. I'm sure he's, he's going to get there though. I mean, he's like, did you see just yesterday he released the podcast on alcohol and I haven't listened to it all. His podcasts are really long and I have to be very committed. Uh, (laughs) They're phenomenal. He is so damn good that I can't keep up because he talks so well about sleep and hormones. So I, I focus on that for a little bit. And then, yeah, no, I love, I love Dr. Huberman. He's amazing. I, I have, I have learned so much from his podcasts and and the scientists that he has on and the data that he shows, the research that he shows, like it, it's not just his opinion, like he shows mm-hmm. all of the science and the mm-hmm. data behind it. And so he would be a real good one to maybe talk about the endocannabinoid system and how it affects the body and what does this look like long-term. And I sent him that message. Scientists. Oh man, maybe we need more people. I know, everybody, right? Tag everybody us and message Andrew Huberman. <laughs> say, hey, yeah, contact you or the Blue to Green podcast and see if we can get them on and talk about this stuff. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, and that's exactly, we just need more science. Mm-hmm. We need more data. I, I do wish that, uh, I, I, I would love to be able to come up. I'm not smart, I'm not smart enough to figure it out. Some sort of data collection ability to, you know, have people come and, and just give their anecdotal stories. You know, even, even that's a data mm-hmm. point. It is a data point, but there's not enough controlled right. um, circumstances with it. Right. You know, when you're doing research, you have to control variables because even if I look at you, I'm like, oh, there's too many variables to say, yes, this is going to work, right? Agreed. You're male, you're probably this tall and this much weight and you have a wife and you have, you know what I mean? Like there's too many variables, yeah, right, right. you know, what's your blood type and what you're eating like and what you're, you know, there, there's so you know, when, when someone's constructing research, a lot of those variables need to be controlled. And so we need to be comparing apples to apples and not throwing in a fruit basket and calling it the cure. Are you, are are you familiar with Dr. Sue Sicily? I don't think so. Is that the ADHD? She's very big into, she now works with maps. She's the one that actually, um, I'm friends with her as well. And she's located here in Arizona. She's actually the one that sued the federal government very recently. What was happening in the cannabis world? If you wanted to do a cannabis research study, Mm -hmm. the federal government grows their weed at one location, which is the University of Mississippi. And it's dirt weed. It's terrible. It's not good. So she sued and uh, sued the DEA and successfully won and now has the ability to actually use what cannabis that she wants to use from 
good growers that have controlled so you know that control everything and have certificates of analysis and all that wow. but she's going to, and her and i've talked about it um i don't know the specifics of it at all but i know that she's mm -hmm. going to doing research regarding mm -hmm. specifically ptsd um and cannabis wow. use yeah Phenomenal. so this is just something i need to reach out to her and, and talk to her and get more and, information on awesome gosh and and maybe the maps community will grow and we'll get scientists that will do the hard work and, and here's you know the other piece of it is this takes longitudinal studies which are years and years mm -hmm. and years and years long mm -hmm. You know, I hope it doesn't take that long. I mean, we we've been able to successfully bring stuff to to market and commercialize it and sell it, and then go, "Oops, that was a mistake. We shouldn't have done that." You know, we didn't have enough data, but it was out there and people right. were using it, and maybe even some people were benefiting from. Um, I don't know. I don't the know. one thing I will always I will always tout though is that the Drug Enforcement Administration, in and of themselves, in their 2020 Drugs of Abuse. And I, I preach this to all cops, all law enforcement, everybody, even admit themselves that no one has ever died from ingestion alone of cannabis. Mm -hmm. So, you you, you know, you, our bodies mm -hmm. know what knows what to do with it. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about smoking and then jumping off a building or smoking it, and getting right, into a right. car crash. I'm talking about the Just actual ingesting. ingestion yeah. and nobody's ever died. So say yeah. you do use it and it's not working and, you, and you're overdosing on it and you got a little paranoia and psychosis, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, you're not going to die. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you're, mm -hmm, you're not mm -hmm, going to die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You I mean, think you're going to die. But right. You're not going to die. <laughs> I tried telling, um, I remember talking to a, a, a client that was detoxing from heroin and she was screaming and she was in pain and saying, um, and I said to her, I promise you'll never have to do this again. This is the one time you only have to do this today. You're not going to die. I know you're hurting. And she's like, but I want to die. I said, I right. know you want to die. But if we can just get through this worst part, you'll never have to do this again. Um, so the feeling is you're going to die um, from detox. But the reality is the only detox you can die from is alcohol or benzodiazepines. Now, so I've heard that recently. Yeah. So if those aren't detoxed in a controlled environment, there is a high risk for death, but, um, cannabis, um, heroin, um, MDNA, ecstasy, Molly, you know, any other drugs, you can't die from detox. Again, you might want to, but you might want to. Yeah. <laughs> you might want to get high, but no, you can't. Right. right. So. Yeah. Deanna, I, I cannot thank you enough for just this totally impromptu, awesome conversation. This has been yeah. really cool. I would love to have a more structured uh, conversation with you in the future and sure. particularly about law enforcement, particularly about first responders and all that type of stuff. Because again, as I've said before, and I'm, I've always been, I, I'm a board member on Arizona Normal and they totally know my background, obviously, but I will never not stop being an advocate for law enforcement and first responders because that's where my passion was. And I want to serve as a warning to other cops that like, look, if you do this bullshit, you're going to go down this path. It's going to lead to terrible, stupid life decisions. And then you guess what? You're not going to be allowed to be a cop anymore. Right. So that that's yeah. the thing is it's like in, in, in this day and age where nobody wants to be a police officer, where we need – good when you know it, and i always say you know if somebody jumps into my backyard with a gun i'm old and broken i've got a broken back i'm not going to fight that person <laughs> i need to be able to pick up the phone and have the biggest yeah. baddest toughest smartest cops coming and responding right. and that's what i want is healthy mentally healthy physically healthy you know law enforcement i i want the firefighters that come in and fight a house fire i don't want them thinking about the dead baby i, I want them present and in the know about what's going on and to have dealt with the trauma, not right. to have suppressed. I mean, I know that shoving down emotions deep down and not talking about them is clearly the best therapy you could ever do, right? <laughs> you know, and but I'm also that therapist that believes in compartmentalization. It yes. has to happen. Yes. You have to be able to, part, you know, but, the, you know, I have counterparts, therapists that, you know, I... I joke and I, I don't mean any disrespect when I say, you know, like the depressed soccer mom, that's just my analogy of the, the drastic difference in the, the, the incredible combat trauma versus depression as a right. therapist, I can treat both. My specialty is over here. And, um, 
yeah, I lost my train of thought, but the, <laughs> the belief that, um, we have to be able to compartmentalize, to do our job. There is a time and a place for discharging emotion and Amen. processing emotion. And it's not when you, you're going to the next call, right? You know, we have to compartmentalize it. Um, we have to just do it. Help. We have to be able to do it healthy. Yeah. I learned of my own burnout when I was like, Oh, I can't compartmentalize. I'm losing my ability to compartmentalize. I'm like danger time to get some help. When you're, when you're sitting, you know, in your instance, when you're sitting with a client who's spilling their heart to you and you're thinking about that, right. it's the same as in law enforcement, when you run 120 miles an hour to a rollover accident and you're thinking about that, right. that's not, that's not good. Right. You know, that's, that's not healthy. It's the, right. okay, I need to move forward. Hey, when I get home, I'm going to yeah. think about that. And yes. then I'm going to deal with that, yes. but later, but not right now. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. I appreciate the conversation. This was great. I hope it was valuable. I, I hope. And again, this is just my thing is just to, to, you know, your job is to do this. My, mine is just advocacy, you know? And, and the other part is too, is like, I don't want, I don't ever want anybody to think that he's just about cops. No, everybody who has mm -hmm. trauma, every, every, whether it's childhood trauma from, you know, an alcoholic parents to yeah. sexual abuse, to being bullied, you know, or whatever the case is, is we all carry trauma with us and there's, but there's resources out there. Yeah. There's amazing resources that are out there, but I, I just think there's so many people that don't know where to start, don't know what to do. You know, and obviously you're in California, I'm in Arizona. There's, there's differences in, 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 in particularly here in Arizona, county by county is very, very different as far as is mental it? health resource. Oh yeah. Uh, I do know that California has a fairly robust mental health. Mm -hmm. um, each county here is I mean, we have counties with only, you know, a few thousand people in them, so they don't have any money funding or resources. I see. I see. And so Arizona, this, the state doesn't fund mental health? Very minimally. Got and it. again, so it, California you, has the Mental Health Act, or we right. did. I don't know if that's still a thing, but um, so that the state gave money to all municipalities in the state um, for mental health resources. And that was huge. Um yeah, I don't know if that's still a thing or not. I'm not in the agency delivery gotcha. of mental health anymore. I'm private. So, um, but yeah, big difference. And, and you're right. Keep advocating, keep advocating, keep sharing your story, keep spreading the word, spreading the message, get people to think, get people to open their minds to um, options and possibilities, normalize mental health challenges. Bottom line, we need to eliminate the stigma. Like, stop it. If you have a brain, you have mental health. The the one thing that that I, I don't know how to ever get this passed through when I released the one at, um, about with the firefighter and when it comes to law enforcement is I don't know how to get agencies to understand that when somebody comes to you and asks for help, those are not the people that you need to be suspending, taking off the road, you know, what? unless they're saying, I'm going to go shoot myself right now. Yeah. The people who are saying I'm having a tough time dealing with blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Those are not the ones you need to worry about. Those are the ones that are asking for help and they need the help. They right. don't need to be put behind a desk. They don't need to be sent home administratively and made a pariah and not talk to. Right. right. Those are the ones that are reaching out and asking right. for help and they need to just be supported as however they need to be supported. Right. right. But that those ones that um, there's mm -hmm. an online uh, gentleman he, and he's a former police officer. He goes by Drew Breezy and he just posted oh, yeah. some. You know, Hello, Drew, Drew Breezy. Of okay. course. Yes. Him, him and I just made contact as well. And he's going to come right. online and we're going to talk about, it. he just posted something today, uh, mm -hmm. something along the, the lines of, you, you, you know, somebody, an officer walks into roll call and they're right. physically fit and physically healthy and all that good stuff. You know, they limp in, right, say, but, what's wrong? What's wrong? What do you right. need? How can I help? Right. Yeah. But when the one that walks in and has the thousand yard stare and is slumped over and not mm -hmm. talking and, you know, mm -hmm. isolating themselves, nobody wants to talk to that person right. who tell him to shut up and get back in his car. Yep. Right. And that goes yeah. for firefighters, EMTs. And that goes for, if you're working a data entry job, Yeah. you know, yeah. it doesn't, again, it's not just law enforcement. It's not just public service. That's just my focus. Cause yeah. that's what I dealt with. Yeah. So and that's yeah. what I was. So yeah. And, and it's, it's, I always say we have to, the culture has to change so we can create policy. We can create programs, but if the culture doesn't change, that doesn't mean crap. Yep. Because at the end of the day, sure, policy says yep. I can, you know, get Officer Smith help, 
but then the locker room talk, the promotions get missed, yep. right? Because mm, we don't know about him. Yep. We, you know, that's the culture that needs to shift and change. I teach peer support teams and I, I teach them how to be that change in their department. But then we've got this, like also this bully system, right? The, the old salty cops or firefighters calling the peer supporters, the hug patrol, get yep. away from me, your hug patrol. And I don't want to talk to that guy. You know, he's sensitive anyway. We all know about him. I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys like, but <clears throat> you know, I, I have a belief that we can only do what we can do one person at a time. Um, you know, I, I, I don't like this thing, but so I, tattooed the starfish on my shoulder as a reminder that um we can only um help one person at a time and that's going to have to be enough because making Amen. a difference one person at a time matters the the old adage of and i grew up with a father who was law enforcement for 32 years and unfortunately he passed away from pancreatic cancer mm -hmm. um I mean, I remember 20 plus years ago, I remember this very vividly. We ran into an old cop buddy of his who had just retired. So this was 20 years ago. So that guy was a cop all throughout the seventies and eighties. And when we walked away, I said, Oh, who was that? He goes, he goes, he's going to be dead within two years from suicide. He could just, you know what I mean? And unfortunately that was exactly the case because there was no support back then in any way, shape or form. And, and, you know, as well as I do, if you've been in, you know, dealing with first responders, it used to be cops, firefighters, everybody were dead within five years of retirement because I mean, the, the numbers still don't really no, change that's, much. Unfortunately, that's not good. it's not, it's not. And, you know, when I analyze that data, that statistic, I don't know what the current statistic is, but it's still not much better. Um, I look at my grandfather because I'm always like, well, why did he have like a 40 year retirement? How did that happen? Maybe it was longer. He retired in 1980 and okay. died in 2016. Like, what is that? I yeah. can't do math. 30 he, had a, he had a good run. He had a good run, but he was also the, the hard ass World War II veteran who never understood what I did. Dina, what is it that you do again? I'm like, oh my gosh, I've told you 500 times, you know, I go to departments, I talk to officers that have been in traumatic situations, officer involved shootings, things like that. But he's like, what the hell for? Because that just wasn't, wasn't, you don't talk about your feelings. Right. You don't talk about this, the effects of the job. Um, and so I always wonder like, gosh, what was he made of? How was he, I don't know. Tony Robbins talks about uh, generations and how generations are so different and how these tough, tough, hard generations grew up in, you know, the depression era, they're just made of different stock. And then they softened, um, you, you know, I say my generation, um, we've softened the world for our kids. Agreed. And we probably screwed them. Because, Agreed. Right. We've, um, my daughter is an, my daughter probably couldn't scrub a toilet to save her life. You know what I mean? Like this poor kid is, she'd be eaten by wolves in a day, you know, <laughs> not really. She's super tough. We're actually going to an explorer meeting tonight. Oh, she, nice. she wants to be an explorer. She wants to be FBI, but you know, we've softened the blow because we thought our life was so hard. Right. But maybe that hard life really created tough people. I, I the thing that I've said, and not just about just what we're just the first responder community, to, uh, I've spoken to um, successful people in the cannabis world, and the ones who had it the hardest starting out are the most resilient. They're right. the most, you know, they 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 think longitudinally, they they think yeah. the long term game and all that type of stuff, and they've yeah. got that resiliency to if yeah. you get kicked a little bit, you're gonna get kicked a little bit, and you should yeah. expect it. It's Walk not that out. you got kicked; it's that you need to get back up and try yeah. again. Right. And I know these are right. stupid cliches that have been said for a million years, yeah. but it's yeah. true. Right, right. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't negate that real suffering is happening. Amen. Amen. Right. It, that doesn't, I think that also, you know, our, I don't know, our first responders are probably seeing um, exponentially larger amounts of trauma in more evil ways. And, and I don't know. And, and we're more di disconnected. We're more detached from community and relationships yeah. and I don't know. So there's a lot of factors, but I'm just going to go to work every day and, and show up and help one person at a time. 
I'm just going to sit back, smoke some weed, try to connect with people who do that and bring the people together. That's, that's what my job is now. I love it. I love it. I love it. Dina, I would love to, like I said, I would love to maybe schedule something else in the future here very soon so we can continue this conversation and and see where it goes from there. I'd love to. I love to. This was great, AJ. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Do you have any problem with me posting this soon? Please post it right now. Anything you want to do. I'm all good. Yeah. Awesome. And I, again, this was amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank so, you. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. And I said, I'll send you a message and we can connect and figure something out. Sounds great. And I, you have a great day and thank you so much. Thanks, AJ. Bye-bye. Bye.